Well, good morning. That was pretty weak. All right, let's. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I know it's Thursday, and I know uh, we're all tired, uh, self included. So uh, that that's normal, and we're all in that together. Uh, but I'm grateful uh, that even though we're tired, right, that God says He gives strength to the weary, right? And so I'll be praying for that for you today. Uh, throughout your day, because we have a big, important day here. As we, uh, it's Thursday already, if you can believe that, and that means uh, concert's coming. Um, I know that you guys are doing a great job preparing for that. As we get ready to continue our journey about what it means to be a follower of Christ, um, I, I, I want to uh, I want us to think about something. Uh, I have a garden at home. Uh, I like I like to try to grow things, and one of the processes or parts of having a garden or growing things is sometimes buying packets of seeds. And I was going to have a packet of seeds with me today, but I forgot to go out and get one. So, But I know you have good imaginations because we've been using them all week, right? So, uh, you know, when you buy a packet of seeds, it, it usually comes with some instructions, right? And one of the instructions is going to tell you, invariably, that you're to take these seeds out of the packet and put them in the in the soil, in the ground. But you know, as I thought about that, I know it's like I have this packet of seeds, and you know, they you know might pay a couple dollars, three dollars, depending on what kind of seeds they are. You know, and say, man, I, I spent three dollars on these seeds. And it seems a little risky to just put them in the ground. Right? Because I mean, th there's risk involved if, if I put them in the ground, right? That maybe, maybe they won't grow. Maybe, maybe something will go wrong. I, there, it just seems a little. But if I keep them, at least I'll have my seeds, right? Some of you are like, he has absolutely lost it. Too much time in the sun, right? And and you sort of get that that silliness of that thought. But I want you to hang on to that, right? We're going to come back to that in, in a little while. As we consider the the call of Jesus to follow him, we've looked at Peter. Right? And we've looked at how Peter was called by, by Jesus to follow him. And, and God interrupted his life. Jesus interrupted Peter's life when it was inconvenient, when it was improbable, when it was inconceivable. And we looked at Nathaniel. And we looked at how sometimes, yes, we have doubts and we have questions and there's skepticism. But even through that, Jesus meets us in our skepticism and invites us to follow him. And we looked yesterday at how Jesus reaches to the outcasts to the people in the margins, to the people overlooked, to the people that are excluded. And he loves to invite them in to his kingdom and into his family, where they gain equal status with every other believer who has been born again by the grace of God. So as we continue to think about the fact that Jesus indeed calls people to follow him. He didn't just call people to follow him when he was on earth. He calls people to follow him now. And he invites you and me to be followers of him. And today, I, I want us to think a little bit about what that requires of us. Because in order to fully follow Jesus with our lives, it requires us to surrender our lives to him. To unconditionally surrender our lives to him. So, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the Gospel of Mark this morning. The Gospel of Mark. Uh, and we're going to begin in verse 27. Mark chapter 8, uh, verse 27. And there we're going to find Jesus with his disciples, with, his, with the twelve. All right, there were many followers of Jesus beyond the twelve. But the twelve were those that were invited to spend the most time with Jesus. To be his traveling companions. To be students of the rabbi Jesus, if you will. And, and so Jesus is with them. And they are up in the northern part of Israel. And it says this, Jesus went out with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And so, they're traveling, they're walking along, and, you know, they're in their sandals. And remember, Matthew has what? Nice sandals. Nice sandals. All right. I think even though he, he, you know, he left his, his career to follow Jesus, I had a feeling he hung on to those sandals. All right? They're just great sandals. They're traveling along, and Jesus asks a question. He says, who do people say that I am? Basically, he's like, you know, guys, what are you hearing? What's the word on the street? What are people saying about 
me. And so Peter is going to, to be one of the people that answer, but it says in verse 28 that they all answered, and I, I'm sure they started yelling out answers and saying things, and they said this, John the Baptist, verse 28, others said Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And so they said, what we're hearing, what are people saying? Well, some people think it's John the Baptist. By now, John has actually been executed, right? He was beheaded for his faith in Christ and for his unwillingness to compromise about Herod's sin. And, and, so, and so some people are saying that this is John the Baptist come back to life. Or some people are saying this is Elijah, the great prophet that's come. Or some people are saying one of the other prophets. And all of these things were, were, were complimentary. And possibly even hopeful of a messianic figure, right? These were powerful prophets that spoke truth to power, and they thought, Jesus is a powerful prophet. But notice what Jesus says next. He says in verse 29, he says, But you, he asked him, who do you say that I am? And this is a pivotal question, because ultimately for all of us, for each and every one of us, it ultimately isn't so important what everyone else says about Jesus. But it's the question that you have to ask and answer for yourself. Who is Jesus? Because this question is the key to everything in our faith in following Christ. And so Jesus says, all right, I, 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 get what you, I, I hear the word on the street. That actually was kind of my introductory question. My real question for you is this. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that? And, and Peter, who is often the first to speak up, he says, you are the Messiah, right? And so Peter knew that while the opinion of the crowd was that Jesus was a prophet or someone great, and while that was complimentary, wasn't fully accurate. That Jesus was much more than John the Baptist. He was much more than Elijah the prophet. That he was much more than just a national reformer or a miracle worker. That Jesus was the Christ. The Messiah, the one whom God had promised and the one whom God had sent into the world. And so this is a this is a big moment. This is a big moment. And so it says it says in verse 30 then that Jesus then warned. He strictly warned them to tell no one about him. He wasn't ready for them to to go public with this announcement, but he, he knew that they needed to know. And and from other from other gospel accounts of this, this scene, we know that, that Jesus complimented Peter on his pronouncement. He said, in fact, he said that Jesus, or Jesus said to Peter, right, that, that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but, but the Spirit, right, that God has revealed this to you, right? And imagine how, how it would have felt for Peter to hear Jesus say that God's revealed something to you about me, that you have supernatural knowledge. How many of you would think that that might make you feel pretty what? Special. Someone said special. All right, yeah, it would make you feel pretty special, right? Yeah, yeah, God did reveal that to me, right? And, uh, you know, Peter was a bit impulsive and liked to speak up, and he's kind of the leader. And, yeah, and so I think Peter is feeling pretty good, right? God reveals things to me. But notice what happens next. It says, Then he began to teach them, verse 31, that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. And so, you know, Jesus says, Yes, Peter, you're right. I am the Messiah. God has revealed that to you. And they had come already to believe that, and this is now confirmation of, of that belief. And for the Jewish people, and even for Peter and, and the other disciples, they were expecting that Jesus would come to establish His kingdom, His rule and His reign, to fulfill the promises that God had made to His people, that someone would be raised up to sit on the throne of David, that He would overthrow the Roman occupiers, that He would solve their greatest problem, that He would set them politically free to once again be a nation. And so that was their expectation. And that was true that God has promised that someone will sit on David's throne. And one day, Messiah Jesus will rule and reign over this whole world. But before He would do that, He had come first 
to set them free from their sin. And the scriptures had pointed to this fact, but it wasn't something at the forefront of their minds. And so Jesus is teaching them. He says it's necessary. It's needful for the Son of Man to suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and rise after three days. And when Peter and the disciples hear this message, they didn't like it. They didn't like it. They they didn't want a Messiah that suffered. They didn't want a Messiah that was captured. They didn't want a Messiah that died. That, that That was unthinkable. And even though Jesus says, rise after three days, I'm not sure they fully even heard that. Have you ever heard something that maybe was just so shocking and difficult and somebody kept talking afterwards, but you didn't hear a thing they said? Right? Because that, that thing that they already said was just resonating so much in your mind. And I imagine maybe that's the case here. And they here died. And, and Peter's thinking, I don't like where this is going. I don't, I don't like this. this. This, no, no, we're not going to have this. And so, and so <coughs> Peter is actually going to do something about it. Look at verse 32. It said, he spoke openly, Jesus, about this. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Right? It's, it's almost comical now, isn't it, as we look back on it. Here's Peter, right? And Jesus is teaching about this. And, and I, I sort of imagine Peter says, Jesus, can we, can, you, can we just, you know, step aside for a second? Can we, can we chat? And Peter's like, Jesus, this, this dying stuff, can we like... Can we tone that down? Right? I, uh, it's scaring the guys, right? And I'm not really, no, like, we're not going to let that happen, Jesus. Right? We, we got you. We got your back. Don't worry about the chief priests. Don't worry about the scribes, right? We'll take care of it. Right? And, and for, for Peter, this is coming out of a sincere heart. Right? For Peter, it's coming out of a very sincere heart. And it literally says he began to rebuke him. And then it says in verse 33, but turning around and looking at the rest of the disciples, and I'm sure they were kind of watching and they were probably eavesdropping a little bit. And it says, looking at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Now, how many of you say that seems a little harsh, right? I mean, I mean, a few minutes ago, it was like, God just revealed to you who I am and you are blessed and then now it's get behind me, Satan. And what had happened was that Peter's thinking in this instance was only horizontal. He was only looking at things through a human point of view. He was only looking at things through his perspective. And from his perspective, even though he was sincere, his perspective that Jesus dying was the worst thing that could happen. And he didn't want that to happen. And what happened is that, that unwittingly he was being used as Satan because Jesus' purpose was to go to the cross. Jesus' purpose was to go to the cross because of the sin of humanity, even for Peter's sin. And so even though Peter, maybe you know, he was a little puffed up because a few minutes ago he's like, God reveals things to me. And maybe Peter thought, you know, God's revealed this to me. But it's easy, it's easy when our thinking is only horizontal right, to miss God's will and God's purposes. And so this is a perfect example of how a sincere heart, but with horizontal thinking, can lead to disaster. Peter was too confident in his ability to hear from God. His mind was on what he thought was best, what he thought was good. And you know, a lot of times when it comes to following Jesus, we have ideas about what it should look like, or what God should do, or how He should lead us, or what He should do for us. And many times, what God does in our lives and what God allows in our lives does not look like what we would expect, what we would want, or what we would choose. And I can look back on my journey of following Jesus and see that many times. And I'm sure that you can and others can as well. But what I've come to know and come to learn is that that God has a purpose and God has a plan. And it doesn't always involve things that I like. And it doesn't always involve things that I understand. But when I don't like it or I don't understand, it's usually because I'm just looking at it through my perspective and my point of view and not God's. And so Jesus has to rebuke him. He's not calling him Satan because he doesn't love him. But he's calling him Satan because he wants him to know, Peter, 
this notion that you have, it's not from God. Right? It's not from God. It's horizontal. Satan is using this to try to distract me from the purpose that I have. And not only that, but Jesus is going to go even further. Look at verse 34. Now he's going to call in the crowd. First there's a conversation with Peter, then the, the disciples. Now he's going to bring in the crowd. And it's just calling the crowd along with his disciples. He said to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And this was way more than Peter had anticipated. Because now not only is Jesus talking about a cross, but he says you too have to take up a cross. And, and we hear about the cross, we sing about the cross, and we should. It's where God's love and grace and mercy was poured out. Where Jesus absorbed our punishment for our sins. And so the cross has become something beautiful for us. Because of what Jesus did. But the cross in first century Rome was the most dreaded form of execution. Roman citizens could not be executed on a cross. It was illegal. And so only non-Roman citizens could be executed by crucifixion. It was the most humiliating, embarrassing, painful, and horrific way to die. It often took days. And so everyone dreaded the cross. And no one talked about the like the cross was not something you talked about in polite conversations. It was horrific. Nobody would mention it. And here Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to pick up your cross. What did that mean? It means that you were picking up the beam of the cross that you would hang on and die. And you were carrying it to your own execution. So this is a very shocking and extreme thing that Jesus says. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross. And follow me. Jesus is saying that the only pathway to follow me is absolute and total surrender. And the, he was saying that following him is not going to be about self promotion or about advancing yourself or making yourself great. That the path of Jesus is dying to self and dying to your old ways and your old desires and your old dreams and receiving Jesus' life and his dreams and his desires for your life. And carrying your cross is not a passive thing. It's not, well, something bad happened to me. And you might hear people say, well, we all have our cross to bear. That's not what Jesus was talking about. He was saying an act of willful surrender to our own rights of self-seeking and striving after our own interests. And so Jesus made it clear that only cross bearers could be his followers. And Jesus makes the terms very clear. Look at verse 35 and 36. He says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Right? Jesus knew this would be a hard thing to hear. It's a hard thing to hear now. He says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? And what can anyone give in exchange for his life? And so Jesus asked some rhetorical questions as he knew his the crowd was hearing this thing that was shocking to them, that was difficult to hear. And he says this, he says, I understand this is hard to hear, but here's what you need to know. If you want to try to save your life, if you think you can avoid difficulty, if you can think you want to avoid pain and avoid hardship, if you think that, that not following me will make it easier, he says, you'll try to save your life, but you'll actually lose it. But if you are willing to lose your life, which might seem terrifying and it might seem scary, he says, you'll actually save it or experience it. And he says, what does it benefit if you gain everything in this world, but you lose your soul? Right? Jesus was very clear that this age that we live in is not forever. That this age that we live in one day will come to an end. But his kingdom, his rule, and his reign is forever. And he is inviting anyone and everyone into his kingdom through the cross, through his life, death, and resurrection, and He's inviting you to experience eternal life. The very life of God lived in you. And eternal life isn't just life that doesn't end, but it's the life of God in you now. You can experience eternal life now. Here in this age, you have the eternal life of God in you if you know Christ. And you're going to live with Him forever and ever and ever. You know, I don't like things that end. Anybody else with me? Right? It's Thursday. I'm already anticipating that this is going to end for me in just a couple days. Right? I have to go home. Right? And I start to get a little sad about that. I don't like change. Anybody else do bad with change? All right. Some of you thrive on change. Some of us hate change. All right? 
So it's like once I get somewhere, I want to stay there. Are you with me? Right? And so, and so change is difficult and ending and goodbyes are difficult. But I'm so thankful that in God's kingdom there won't be any endings and there won't, there won't be any goodbyes. Right? Aren't you grateful for that? And so with that eternity in mind, Jesus asked us to make a decision. With eternity in mind, with forever in mind, with His kingdom and His glory in mind, He asks us to make a decision. And the decision He invites us to make is a willingness to set aside our rights, our dreams, our will for His. And it can seem scary because it seems safer when we're in charge. It seems safer when we're calling the shots. Right? It seems safer when I'm in control. You know, a lot of people feel safer driving a car than they do flying in a plane. And yet you are statistically infinitely safer in a plane than in a car. But when you're in the car, you feel like what? I've got some what? Control. I've got some control. But it's an illusion. And it's an illusion to think that we can control our lives. But Jesus invites us to surrender that to Him. And He would tell us that you can't, you can't gain resurrection life without dying first. Now remember when I told you about those seeds, right? Those seeds that I bought. And it seems a little risky. And it seems a little scary for me to put them in the ground because maybe they won't germinate. Maybe they won't come up. Maybe an animal will dig them up. Maybe it won't rain. Maybe something will happen. I could have all these fears. But if I leave the seeds in the packet, they will never be able to do what? They'll never grow up. Right? And they'll never fulfill the purpose for which they were made. And it's the same way for us. If we don't surrender our life to Christ, right? if we don't say yes to Him and unconditionally surrender to Him, if we're not willing to allow God to do that, it'll be just like the seed. And so here's the thing. When you say yes to God, it might seem scary. It might seem risky. It might feel like you're giving up control. But here's the thing. It will set you free to be who God saved you to be, intended you to be, and called you to be. And Jesus knew himself, the very own struggle. He knew Jesus is fully God, and yet he's fully man. He experiences humanity. And Jesus was tempted by Satan, right? Luke chapter 4. Satan gives him the chance to, says, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you the whole world. I'll give it to you right now. Right now, without, without the pain, without the cross. I'll give you the world. But Jesus knew that that was an absolute lie. And Jesus knew the temptation to take the easy way, the self-fulfilling way. And Jesus resisted that. And so as we think about our own lives and our own call, I want to give you three things that I see from our passage today in Mark that, that I think will help us as we think through this. That if we're going to follow Jesus, what do we need to see and know? What do we need to see and know? Number one, we need to see and know Jesus' true identity as the Messiah and the Savior of the world. It's why Jesus asked that question that day. Who do you say that I am? Because if you're going to surrender your life to Jesus, you need to know who He is. Right? You need to know that He is the God of the universe, the God of creation. Colossians chapter 1 talks about that. Right? He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. All things were made by Him and through Him and for Him. And that God came to us in the person of Jesus. He lived for you. He died for you. And He rose from the dead. And if we're going to surrender to Him, we need to see Him for who He is. And we need to know His love for us. Right? You need to know that He loves you with an unending, incredible love. And when you understand that He... That love led Him to the cross for you. When you understand his, the depth of His care and His compassion towards you, that is critical in your decision. Am I going to say yes to Jesus with my life? Number two. Number two. I need to see and know Jesus' call to align my way of thinking with His. You see, if I'm going to unconditionally surrender to God, I need to align my thinking with His. Because just like Peter... I can have moments of clarity in my spiritual life where I see God for who He is, right? You're the Messiah, right? You're the Savior. Yes, Peter, God's revealed that to you. And then a few minutes later, right, I can go back to my horizontal thinking 
about my own selfishness, my own ways, my own desires. And, you know, I've shared a little bit of my testimony over the last couple of weeks. And, you know, when I was here as a camper, I felt God's call on my life to surrender to Him. But I struggled with that call, right? Because that call meant that I'd have to give up certain notions that I had, certain dreams that I had, certain plans that I had. And I, I really pushed back against God's call on my life because I wasn't so sure that that's what I wanted. But the problem was, it was because I was thinking horizontally. I was thinking about me and my wants and my desires and my dreams. And God calls us to align that thinking, not with what we want, but with what He wants. How do we do that? We go to God's Word. right? We spend time in God's Word, reading it to hear from Him. We spend time in prayer. We need to spend time listening to His Spirit and allowing God to align our way of thinking with His. And we have to do that daily. And number three, we need to see and know God's call, Jesus' call, to unconditionally surrender our lives to Him. And I believe that God may have brought you here this week for you to hear His call on your life. Right? As, I, as I shared on Monday, we live in a difficult world. We live in a world filled with all kinds of problems and challenges. Right? We live in a dangerous world. Many, many, many places in this world, it's not safe to follow Jesus. But you are alive right now in this moment because God willed and intended for you to be alive. He raised you up for this moment and for this generation. And He has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. And He wants to use you in extraordinary ways to bring Him glory by serving Him, by living for Him, by loving Him, by loving people, by sharing the gospel, by showing the kindness and love and compassion of a Savior in whatever field He calls you to. God might call you to vocational ministry like He did me. God might call you to be a music educator. What a powerful testimony we heard last night about the influence and impact that you can have in education. God might call you to performance. And God might use you in that arena, in that world. God might call you to a career that has nothing to do with music or ministry. And in that realm, God will use you to live for Him and to serve Him and to serve His kingdom. And He calls you to unconditionally surrender to Him. And here's the thing about Jesus. He makes known the cost up front. You know, we're familiar with the bait and switch tactics, aren't we? Right? Where we present this really amazing offer, but it's not really what? It's not really amazing. Or you go on Airbnb and you're like, man, that looks like an amazing place to stay, right? And then you get there and you're like, it's a dump, right? We're, we're familiar with bait and switch, but Jesus never baits and switch anyone. He never says, oh, come to me and get saved and have a wonderful life. It'll be easy. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. Actually, you need to die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. No, he tells us that up front. If you want to be my follower, if you want to come after me, you have to be willing to pick up your cross. And picking up our cross means that I'm willing to die to my wants, my wishes, my dreams, and say, God, whatever you want to do in my life, whatever you want to do, wherever you want to lead me, whatever you want, I'm willing to say yes. And you know what? There are moments of of surrender where it's a big moment where we recognize that and God did that for me here. But what I've realized is that It doesn't just take those big moments. We need daily surrender, right? Daily surrender. And as I walk through my call of my life, I I, I finally, after three years, said yes to God. But then I began to try to qualify it. And I said, God, I'll be a youth pastor. And then after a few months, God convicted me. And he was like, hmm. And I was like, all right, God, I'll be a pastor. Felt good for a couple months. Got convicted again. And I was like, fine, I will be a missionary. Right? I know that's what you really want. You really want to move me to some obscure country around the world that I'm terrified to go to. And actually, my first ministry position was a youth pastor. But the point wasn't that God didn't want me to do that. The point was God wanted me to take the qualifications off of how I would serve Him. That I would take off the qualifications of God, I'll serve you this way. You know, many times we like to come up with a plan for our life and then take it to God and say, God, can I get your signature on this? God, would you sign off on this? Like, because we love Him. We, we want His blessing on our life. We really do. It's sincere. We're like, God, these are my dreams. You know, can I, can I get your permission? Like, how many of you ever got your parents' permission really quick and hope they didn't really know what they were signing, right? All right. I'm sure that confession is good for your soul and you can be glad the camera's not turned on you. All right. 
But when we do that with God, God says, no, that's, that's not how it works. Right? We come to Him with that blank piece of paper that we signed and say, God, here's my life. Here's my life. Take it and use it however you want. And Jesus never bait and switches us. He never says it'll be easy. He doesn't promise it'll be safe. He doesn't promise that it will come without cost. That there won't be a price to pay for following him. But he says, remember, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. And what good does it do to gain the whole world? And lose your soul. You've been called to follow Jesus, and it's the greatest invitation that you could ever receive. There's not a greater invitation. There's not a more noble invitation. There's not a more honoring invitation than the invitation that God offers you. What holds you back? I want you to think about that. What's holding me back? And for me, and for most of us, it's this thing. It's fear. Right? It's fear. What holds us back? There's a cost to be counted and considered when we follow Jesus. But what holds us back most often is fear. What will it be like? What will it cost me? What will I have to give up? What will people think? What will people say? There, there, there's all kinds of fears. I'm not good enough. I'm not, I mean, I dealt with that. God, I, I can't do, I can't be a pastor, right? I don't like talking in front of people. I could, I could never do that. I just wanted, my, my thought was, I wanted to be a regular person, right? Are you with me? I don't even know what that is, right? And sometimes our fears are rational. And sometimes our fears are irrational. But whatever your fears are, you can bring them to God and say, God, I want to unconditionally surrender my life to you. I'm, I'm feeling a little afraid about that. Just tell God. He understands. And here's a promise that God reminded me of many years ago. It's a promise He gave in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. And I've clung to this promise many times in the most difficult moments of life. He says, don't be afraid, little flock. Or fear not, little flock. Because it's your Father's delight or good pleasure to give you His kingdom. You say, I I'm scared that I'm going to have to give up too much to follow Christ. I'm going to have to give up my dreams, living near my family, my pursuits, my wishes, my comforts, my safety, my security, right? And yes, you will have to give up something to follow Christ. And the cost will be different for every one of us. Every one of us will pay a different cost. And we're not to compare. You know, Peter, you know, he wanted to know, well, what about other people? And you no, know, you will pay a cost. It will be different than what I pay. But I promise you this, it will be worth it. Because it's your Father's good pleasure to give you His kingdom. Right? You're going to inherit all that God is and all that God has will be yours forever. You say, anything that I give up to serve God will be more than experienced in His kingdom. And allow that truth to overcome the fear that might hold us back. Let's pray together. Father, I thank You that You're a God who calls us. Father, we are not deserving. We could never earn Your love. We could never earn the right or the privilege to be called by you. But Father, you call us anyway. And Father, I thank you that you reach out into the margins and you call the, the undeserving because we're all undeserving. And Father, you call us to salvation and the forgiveness of our sin. You call us to eternal life through faith in you and your son, Jesus Christ. But Father, I thank you that you also call us to surrender our lives to you, to say yes to you to say yes to your will, your dreams, and your desires. And Father, I pray that for each and every one of us that we would overcome our fears about what that will cost, that we will learn to trust you because of your love for us. I pray that everyone here would so deeply experience your love and your grace and your mercy and your goodness that that would overcome their fears. And Father, I pray that you would raise up out of this room many who would say yes to you and follow you and that you would use their lives in extraordinary ways to serve you and to glorify you and to make an impact in this world. And Father, I pray for myself that for the rest of my life that I might continue to say yes to you. I know it's easy to say yes for a season. And Father, it's easy for our thinking to get back to being horizontal. And so Father, I pray that you would turn each of our eyes to you and that we would surrender our lives daily for your kingdom and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name.